Father, we count it a privilege to be in your presence and to receive that which the Holy Spirit grants and gives to us. As the Lord Jesus said, all things that the Father have are mine, and he, when he comes, the Spirit, he shall take that which is of mine, and he shall disclose or reveal it unto you. So we do stand into the ministry of the Holy Spirit to take the things of Jesus Christ and reveal them to us, Father, to your own satisfaction. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been reading through in the arena of faith. I'm probably two-thirds way through. And I don't know how many years it's been, but it's very much different to read it now. And all I can say is I'm aware of a deeper level of consecration than ever before. And it's a heart issue. It's not so much in outward manifestations, although it does include that. But it's becoming more separated under the Father. And what happens is if we draw near to Him, He draws near to us. That's what James 4 says. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. That is very slowly and progressively becoming more real. And when the Lord draws near, what happens is the whole perspective of time and space, as we know it, shrinks. And that which is eternal, and that which is of infinite value, becomes more predominant, more weighty. In fact, the Hebrew word for glory is kavod, which means weighty, has substance. And I think that that is really a good thing. He was talking about revival. He said, you know, when people pray for revival, he says, you don't need to pray for revival. You need to start now and start walking in the steps that represents revival. You don't wait for it. You become that which represents and embodies revival so that out from you, it will flow and begin to affect others around you so that revival begins with an individual. And I'll never forget asking Brother Hewn when we met one time, I think it was Arkansas, well, what is the secret of the growth of the church in China? And it says family by family. It begins with family. So may this local church become the friends of God. And as Abraham became God's friend, the Lord's friend, what does that mean for us to come to a place where God can actually call us his friend? Abraham, my friend forever, is a statement God made with reference to Abraham. I think that's pretty amazing. God would have those that he refers to as friends. And by the way, that is the result of him having a circumcised heart, which we will look at tonight. Before we begin picking up where we left off on Sunday, I want to read from Day by Day, which is the compilation of various writings of Austin Sparks. This is the August 1st, Day by Day. It's titled, Appropriating Christ. To be delivered not only from sin but also from the authority of Satan, is a tremendous thing. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Romans 8, 33 and 34. What is the value of that? The accuser comes along and tries to lay a charge against us. What is our ground of answer? Oh, our ground of answer is this. It is Christ that died and is also risen. That is the way to answer the accusation of the enemy. Christ has triumphed over sin and over all the ground of Satan's authority. You and I can never meet the enemy in ourselves. He would win the argument every time. But if we present him with Christ, what can he do? The prince of this world comes and he has, the Greek is a double negative, absolutely nothing in me. John 14.30 These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, to say that, that means he and his humanity had a circumcised heart. What power does the devil have? In Christ's death and resurrection, all his power has been destroyed. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Romans 8.33 Christ in you, you all, plural, corporate, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27 Do you follow that? That is the provision God has made. And if only we had a fuller, readier apprehension of Christ, we should find that to be the way of victory. What is it that the Holy Spirit works upon in order to make the victory in us actual? It is not our struggles to be better. The Holy Spirit never helps us in a struggle to be better. We may struggle on forever and die struggling, and the Holy Spirit will not help us if that is the way in which we think we are going to be either saved or sanctified. 
what is it with which the Holy Spirit will cooperate? It is our faith, apprehension, and appropriation of Christ as our perfection, as our salvation. So I'll read that again. What is it with which the Holy Spirit will cooperate? It is our faith, apprehension, and appropriation of Christ as our perfection, as our salvation. Sanctification, salvation. Stop looking at yourself and your own sin and get your eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus as perfection for you to God and from God to you. And as you take him by faith, not what I am, O Lord, but what thou art, I in myself am bad. In me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. But the Lord, you are my salvation. You are my righteousness. You are my holiness. You are my sanctification. I hold on to you for all that. The Holy Spirit makes that good in us, and that progressively, and by faith as we continue in our apprehension and appropriation of Him. It is our appreciation of Christ, our pastor would say, occupation with Christ, that is the Holy Spirit's ground of activity. That is the way of deliverance. Isn't that tremendous? Just one other little detail I want to clear away before we return to this whole issue of circumcision and Christ being the veil through which we have access into the presence of God. It's a statement made in Acts 11, which I was studying today as I was reading through Eric Sauer's In the Arena of Faith. We see in this passage, when they came to Antioch, there's a report of the state and condition of the church at Antioch. In 21 verse 11, And the hand of the Lord was upon them, and a large number believed and turned unto the Lord. And the news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch, that is, to fetch Paul. Then when he came, notice, then when he came and witnessed the grace of God, he also began encouraging them with all resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. In the original, it's very interesting. He encouraged them with purpose of heart to continue with focus to abide in Christ, to abide. Prosmeno, the word meno is to abide. This is an intensified form. So think of that. With purpose of heart to remain and abide in the Lord. Be faithful, to stay bonded to Him. There are a number of different ways in which it's translated. So isn't that amazing? Purpose of heart. The word there is prothesis. It has to do with the eternal purpose of God. So purpose of heart means God's purpose for him and for you and for his church is that which governs your heart. Purpose of heart. It's God's purpose. That's quite an amazing statement. And now if that's true, then to that degree, when people come into our presence, there will be a witness of the grace of God. You see? There will be a tangible, manifest reality. The grace of God will be upon such ones whose heart is the purpose of God and who are remaining or abiding and remaining true to the Lord. All right, let's notice again the passage in Colossians 2.11 because that's a reference to Christ's flesh. Remember, we notice in Hebrews 10 that the veil, into the most holy place, his flesh has been rent. And so his death on the cross had provided a way into the very presence of God. So in Colossians 2, this is quite an amazing statement. We have a juxtaposition in this passage. That is, two parallel truths that are interrelated and interdependent upon one another. And that is, in the circumcision of Christ, principalities and powers are dealt with. And they're dealt with not only in a judicial way, but dealt with specifically and judicially in terms of a practical way in which the judgment against Satan is practically being executed. Because before man was created, the lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels, and he was judged by God, guilty as charged. He appealed the case, and man is created and comes on the scene as a part of the means by which God would answer the appeal to Antidikos, Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12, and who is the accuser in First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. We see that in the pronouncement of that judgment, the sentencing has been delayed. There's an appeal. And so from the creation of Adam, his fall, and all throughout human history, Satan, as the legal opponent in a lawsuit, he is appealing the judgment. 
and therefore the sentencing that will occur at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, Revelation 20 verse 10, has been put on hold until there is that in his church, God's people, in a practical way, in a corporate way, no place for him. With each one of us, the sanctification, the work of the cross is, through the circumcision of the heart, is removing that which represents an interface, a place for Satan. Remember when Satan is cast out in Revelation chapter 12, it's because there's no more place found for him. In other words, legally he is seeking to maintain that place, but there's no place found for them any longer. They've been displaced, you see. And so the process of getting there has been a corporate endeavor of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. I'll just pick up verse 11, because the fullness of God in Christ is the context we see in verses 9, and in him you've been brought to fullness, and verse 10, and he, Jesus Christ, as the one in whom all the fullness of God dwells bodily, is head over all rule and authority, and in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In parallel to that, the same truth, only in different language, is buried with him in baptism. Okay? So this circumcision of Christ, as we think about that when he's on the cross, what is taking place? Well, what we are in Adam is referred to in Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, and following as the outer man. The outer man is in contradistinction to the inner man, the hidden man of the heart, which is mentioned in First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, the hidden man of the heart. The inner man, as it's referred to in Romans seven. In this passage we see that which represents who Jesus Christ is as the last Adam. There's the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse fifteen when he had removed the rulers and authorities. Okay? The apicdasis, that is, it's a strong term, like putting off a garment, putting off and laying aside as an old worn out garment, the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. That's the veil. That which separates us from God is the veil of the flesh. So he becomes that by taking on our identity. And so on the cross, in his death, there is the removal of that which represents the whole species in Adam, which is the veil. Man in his fallen state cannot enter into the presence of God. So when he who knew no sin was made sin, obviously he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Notice the word removal, that's the noun. In verse 15, the participle that has the same root, and linguistically it is related. He canceled out the certificate of debt, verse 14, the decrees against us which were hostile to us. Satan employs the law, to accuse us, tempts us, and then uses the law to accuse us. Well, on the cross, he has taken it, that is, the legal certificate of death, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, when he disarmed the rulers and authorities. And there we have apodecomai. In other words, it's the participial form, same root as we find in chapter 2, verse 11. In the thinking of Paul, who is speaking by the Spirit, We are made to understand that on that cross, when this Adamic flesh was dealt with and removed in the death of Christ, that nexus, that which connects Satan with the human race, was removed, taken into death, and Satan is rendered completely inoperative. He is rendered powerless. The only connection, the only interface, the only influence that he has is on that which is the flesh. He has no access to the new man. He has zero access to who we are as begotten of God, which is defined in 1 John 3, 9 as we who have the seed of God. Seed, the divine sperma, the DNA of God. We have the very DNA of God in us. And that DNA is all the information code that includes our future glorification. That body that shall be, it's there. It's not yet activated. It requires resurrection, but it's in our DNA, in the sperma of God, 1 John 3, 9. Think about that. I mean, here he is using Old Testament terminology of circumcision, which is related to the covenant, and simultaneously when he's dealing with the body of flesh, that's corporate, that's the whole Adamic race, verse 11, he did this when he disarmed, he put off as an old worn out garment the rulers and authorities and made a public display of them, having triumphed of them through the cross. That's quite astonishing, actually. 
We'll just notice something more about circumcision in Deuteronomy chapter 10. It's used two different ways in Deuteronomy. One is a statement of fact, and the other is an exhortation that we are to do. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, Paul would be obviously fully cognizant of such passages. Beginning with verse 12, Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear, that is revere, and honor, and respect, reverence the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and love him, and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's going to require something. If it's going to be all of our heart and all of our soul, then something's going to have to be removed. That is the veil. The veil that's over the heart is mentioned with reference to the Old Covenant in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Love and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest of heavens, the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their seed, their descendants after them, even you above all peoples as it is this day. Circumcise then, literally, the foreskin of your heart. That's exactly what it says. In other words, if you're going to come into the fullness of the blessing of your covenant relationship with me, by the way, covenant is the same terminology that's used for marriage in the Old Testament. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Stiffen your neck no more. That's rebellion. That's being obstinate. What is this foreskin of the heart? What is that? It's the flesh. It's that which we are by nature in Adam that has not been dealt with by the cross. It's exactly what it is. It's what we are by nature. The works of the flesh are these. Paul talks about in Galatians. He mentions the works of the flesh there. So the flesh has attributes. It has characteristics. It has works. It has deeds. It expresses itself. It's the old man. It's sin in the singular. Notice, this is what they are to do. If you're going to be able to walk in covenant relationship with me, you need to deal with those things that are contrary to my will, that are contrary to loving me and serving me in the previous verses. In other words, it can't be our own. We belong to him. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in our bodies and our spirits which belong to him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, last verse. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, And the Lord of Lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who does not show partiality, nor take a bribe. He talks about other issues there related to his faithfulness. Now, if we turn to Deuteronomy 30, Deuteronomy 28, there's the contrast between walking in covenant loyalty and being blessed. And then if you walk in disobedience to God's covenant, you will be cursed. And by the way, the flesh is cursed. Jesus became a curse on the cross, but that flesh is a cursed domain. And practically, if we walk in that, we are walking in death. So there's the renewal of the covenant obligations in Deuteronomy 28, and actually grave consequence for disobedience. Then we come to chapter 30. So it will become when all these things have come upon you, The blessing and the curse, Deuteronomy 28, which is a reiteration of what was given in Leviticus 26. The blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations which your Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him. Return is a Hebrew term for repentance. That's the language. When you return, that is you repent, you turn and you return to the Lord and obey, that is listen to his voice, With all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, you begin to walk in repentance. Notice this. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity. He will literally restore your captivity. And have compassion on you, will gather you from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. In other words, you'll be restored to the promised land. If your outcasts are at the ends, literally, of the heavens. The ends of heaven. That's actually what it says. The ends of heaven. From there, the Lord your God will gather you, and from there, he will bring you back. That's called integration on a vast corporate level. So in principle, that happens with people who are SRIDID. 
at a core level there begins to be repentance then God begins this process of restoring our captivity and the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your forefathers possessed and you shall possess it that's the inheritance and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers moreover the Lord your God will circumcise your heart in other words you're commanded to do that in chapter 10 but this is a process of grace God for us is applying the cross to make a provision for that veil that would separate us from living in a more conscious presence of God in the most holy place which was provided for us when the veil was rent through Jesus' flesh as we noted already in Hebrews 10 the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants what will happen? to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, in order that you may live. In order that you may live. Let's notice in the New Testament, if we notice the definition of circumcision. In other words, it's spiritual. Because the Jews were making this a big issue with the mission going to the Gentiles. They were demanding that, yes, it's faith in Christ plus circumcision. It's faith in Christ plus keeping the holy days. And Paul says you'd have none of it. It's faith in Christ plus nothing. The Jews made the big deal, and understandably so. We know from Romans 4, it's the sign and seal of the covenant. It's a physiological way to describe being in covenant with the Lord. So they would enforce that very strongly. So notice in Romans 2, verse 25. He's already confronting these self-righteous Jews who say one thing and do another. You say you should not commit adultery, verse 22, do you commit adultery? That is, in your heart. Jesus confronted them on that. Verse 25, for indeed, circumcision is of value. If you practice the law, you're walking in covenant relationship with God. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. If therefore the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Yes. The real issue is, as you read on in Romans 3, nobody keeps the law. But it's using this assumption based upon what the self-righteous Jew believes. And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you, who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Notice outwardly. This is an outward thing. This is symbolic. That doesn't make you a Jew. Neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. The circumcision of Christ was not an outward thing. It was inward. On the cross, he, as the last Adam, being made sin, and into death, that Adam nature that he became identified with in the death of Christ and in his baptism into death... It is stripped off, and in that process, principalities and powers were stripped off. They were like clinging to that. As we see in Psalm 118, they're surrounding him like bees. And Psalm 22, the bulls of Bashan are surrounding him. The bulls of Bashan in Psalm 22, what do you think that is? Cows? These are principalities and powers. This connects with the fallen watchers in Genesis chapter 6. These entities were out to take him down, take him out, get rid of him. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that Satan was blinded to the fact that he was serving God as an instrument of God's will. He did not know this. He didn't have the ability. Just hold your place here for a moment. 1 Corinthians 2, 6, in contrast to worldly wisdom and the wisdom of man and the wisdom of this age. In 1 Corinthians 2, 6, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Telios, tele, just means God has an end and purpose for our redemption. That end and purpose is to be complete, to be perfected. That's sanctification. It's translated mature. We do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Now, it's very interesting. This term rulers can have a human dimension to it, like we see in Ezekiel 28. We see the prince of Tyre. You see the Prince of Tyre, he, he's like a god. Then you get to Ezekiel twenty eleven, and then it shifts from the Prince of Tyre to the King of Tyre, which is the fallen cherub. 
So there's an interface between the Prince of Tyre, who manifests the same attributes of the arrogance of Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. This terminology, rulers, is used of principalities and powers. Satan is the archon, the prince of this age. It would be the principalities and powers interfaced with the rulers, the Sanhedrin, the Roman officials that crucified Christ. It's not either or, it's both. It ultimately, behind this, looks towards the satanic hierarchy. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age had understood, for had they understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan would not have executed that which stripped him off and left him exposed and helpless. He has nothing left. The only thing he can work through is through a judicially dead corpse, a crucified vessel. That's all he can work through. And so if we choose to walk out of that uncrucified life, he has access to us. In Christ, it's gone. In Christ, it's circumcised. But that doesn't mean it's been dealt with in us. Notice he says, verse 28 of Romans 2, He is not a Jew as one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. In other words, this is a type, it's representative, a symbol of a spiritual reality. We see more of that in Romans 7. Tremendous. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, and not by the letter, and his praise is not from him but from God. So on the cross, the Holy Spirit is present, is he's being judged by the Father, that knife of death, that judgment, he's being circumcised in his heart. On that cross, his heart is so one with what we are by nature in Adam that he's pierced right through to his heart. So when the Roman soldier pierced his side, that is symbolic of what had already taken place judicially on the cross. His heart was pierced. Pierced. Ezekiel chapter 6 verse 9. His heart was shattered and broken because, he says, of their idolatrous hearts. And Paul alludes to this in Philippians 3 as he's always having to deal with the Judaizers which hounded him and wherever he went, they would seek to come in and undermine and to add to the gospel like we see in Galatians and the book of Hebrews. So in Philippians 3, it says, Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Now what Paul is doing right here, if you only knew what a provocateur he was right here, what he was being. The Jews saw Gentiles as dogs. The dog was a filthy animal. It carried disease in the ancient world. They were not pets. Okay? They were dangerous. They were in packs. And they carried disease. In derision, the Jews would refer to Gentiles as Gentile dogs. The goyim. So Paul takes that very term and just flips it around. Beware of the dogs. He's talking about Judaizers. Beware of the evil workers, that is, those who demand circumcision. Beware of the katatomi, those who mutilate the flesh. The legitimate term for circumcision under the direction of the law is peritomi. Paul takes the very term and he says, they're mutilators, what they are. Now that'll get you in trouble, that can get you killed, by the way, if you're in the presence of a rabid mob of Jews. Now, there were 40 that took a vow that they would not eat or drink in the book of Acts until Paul was killed. He did not tolerate anything added to the gospel. You read Galatians, and he comes down like a hammer. You notice in Jeremiah 23, when God speaks to Jeremiah, his word is like fire. It's like a hammer. Well, that's the way Paul is, is he deals with Judaizers. In fact, the Lord was even more severe in Matthew 23 when he confronts the self-righteous religious Jews of his own day, the religious leaders. He refers to them as scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. So notice he says, Beware of the dogs, these Judaizers, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. That is the mutilation, it's false circumcision. What they're demanding is not even legitimate anymore. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even 
in the flesh, what I am by nature. And notice what he talks about flesh. It's his status as a Jew. The highest possible status of being a Jew. He calls it flesh. It's all gone in Christ. His whole heritage, pedigree, and you know what even disappears at the cross? This will touch some of the people who are really into this Hebrew roots thing. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. So guess what happened on the cross? He died as a Hebrew. What are you going to do with that? He died as a Hebrew. In Christ there are no Hebrews. There are no Jews. There are no Gentiles. Just one new man. See? That gets you in trouble. That means you don't get that. You're going to persecute someone like Paul who stood firm on that. He was very, very adamant that when you have Christ, you have everything. All the holy days point to him. Feast days point to him. If you have him, you have all that which was a shadow of what has become a reality in him. In fact, Paul, in his inimical way, that is, he can't be imitated, he compares the holy days of the pagan Galatians in Galatians 4, juxtaposes that with them going back to Judaism and celebrating the feasts and the holy days. He juxtaposes that. Days and months and seasons. He even mentions it in Colossians 2, 19, 20 in there somewhere. Paul was not someone that you could get along with if you wanted to add something to Christ. And that would include any kind of Old Testament ceremonial feast days. Anything that would represent that which was pointing to Christ. If you want to cling to that or try to enforce that in any way you're going to get hit with a jackhammer with the Apostle Paul. Now, if that's your mindset and you're not imposing that on others, then you can go to Romans 14 and Paul says, if that's where you are because you just haven't grown up yet and seen the fullness of Christ, some people honor the Sabbath and some people honor every day the same, let each man be convinced in his own mind. Paul doesn't make that an issue as long as you don't make it an issue. But the Judaizers were, and that's Galatians, you see. All of this has to do with the outer man. That's the whole point. Anything that has to do with the five senses, and we associate this with some religious practice, like the whole temple worship, everything we see in the book of Hebrews, the altar, all that they were involved with in terms of the temple service and sacrifices, it all has to do with the outer man. It all has to do with the first covenant. And in the book of Hebrews, we have a better covenant, we have a better sacrifice. Jesus in his flesh as he was on the cross it's rent from top to bottom it was an act of God and we now have access into the very holy holies and there are no Jews there there are no Gentiles there's nothing of Adam it's just one new man where Christ is all and in all that's Colossians 3.11 the most obnoxious thing to God is religion and our church where I was ordained our pastor would say the devil's ace trump in the world is religion that's how he maintains his grip and hold upon deceived humanity is through religion. Man, by man's efforts, trying to gain God's approbation and trying to gain some favor from God through something that we can do. Or we can be more holy if we do this in terms of that which represents a shadow, that which points to Christ. If we have Christ, we have all. If it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to be at home in Jesus, Colossians 1.19, if all the fullness is in Jesus... And he's now at the right hand of the Father. And if we have access to him through that veil of his flesh, why would we want to add anything to that? The only rituals that the church recognizes as being valid is baptism in the Lord's table. Nothing else. There's not Shabbat. You don't keep Shabbat. You don't. The Sabbath rest of God in Hebrews chapter 3, 7 through chapter 4, verse 13 is Christ himself. The Sabbath is a person. A person. The person. John chapter 12. And we'll start with verse 27. As he's facing the cross. Remember, people want to see Jesus. These Gentiles want to see Jesus. They're not going to see Jesus until the grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies. The grain of wheat, Jesus. And then when he's resurrected as the parent grain, he shall see his seed and prolong his days. Isaiah 53.10 So he says, My soul has become troubled. And verse 27, John 12, the perfect tense there, means he's entered a state and it's irreversible. He's already made that decision. And it would be possible to remove this cup from me, but he is troubled. It's a state he's entered into. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. There came, therefore, a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. That is... 
in resurrection. The multitude, therefore, who stood by heard it. They were saying it had thundered. In other words, a spiritual reality they only see through the natural. This is the outer man speaking. This is uncircumcised flesh. They miss the whole supernatural event, and they just describe it to the natural. That's typical of uncrucified soul life. They thought it had thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. You see? They're not in sync with the Spirit of God. They don't know what's going on. They can't because the outer man is what's ruling. It's not the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. And Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Cosmos Diabolicus. That is the entire world system under the rulership of Satan. It's the organized, ordered system, cosmos. So we get a word cosmetics. Women try to do their best sometimes to order their makeup so that they have, it's called cosmetics, it's cosmeo. It's an ordered arrangement. So Satan has a highly structured and organized satanic system whereby he rules this world. So now judgment is upon the satanic world system, cosmos, world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. So he's been judged. The appeal is made. Cast out. How? Judicially. When Jesus Christ is circumcised, Colossians 2.11, and simultaneously principalities and powers are stripped off. So judicially, it's a done deal. The sentence only awaits the church coming to that place of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so the God of peace will have the instrument to crush Satan under the feet of the church. But it will be a circumcised church. In other words, in resurrection, there will be nothing of the old. And at the end, in Ex Anastasis, that is Philippians 3.11, there will be nothing in that remnant that represents a manifestation of the Adamic identity. Remember we saw Sunday on the Mount of Transfiguration? They saw Jesus only. So when Jesus Christ rises as the morning star, 2 Peter 1.19, when he rises the morning star on the hearts of that remnant, people will see Jesus only. That's it. Jesus. It's going to be there. It's never happened. And of course, the complement of that is John chapter 17. The world will know and believe that the Father sent Jesus. There will be a corporate testimony. We've seen that in other individuals, but it's never been corporately realized. So look at that. The ruler of this world, that's Satan, shall be cast out. Well, that hasn't happened yet. But when it comes to any place that he may have had access, we know in Job chapter 1 he had access into the presence of God. Well, perhaps there was a degrading right here. When Jesus Christ passed through the heavens, exalted above the heavens, he took a seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. After all, rule, authority, and principality, and power were made subject to him. First Peter 3, verse 22 there was a diminishing of his domain at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he just doesn't have the latitude and the longitude that he had before the resurrection. It was apparently here because it says the ruler shall be cast out. Now ultimately, that's going to come in increments. We're going to see in Revelation 12, he'll be cast out of the second heavens down to the earth. And then when Jesus returns to the second advent, Revelation chapter 21 and following, He shall be seized by one of his peers and thrown into the abyss, which is Tartarus, for a thousand years. So there are steps to his being degraded and demoted. Steps. And what God is waiting for now is for that which represents the church corporately, that the circumcision of Christ becomes a practical internal reality in us is we will see the effects of what he says here. Now is judgment upon this world, the ruler of this world shall be cast out. That's Satan. And then if you turn to chapter 14, verse 28, you have heard, John 14, 28, you have heard that I said to you, I go away and I will present tense be coming to you. He's referring to his ascension and the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. He's not talking about his post-resurrection experiences here. That's not in John. That's recorded in the Synoptic Gospels. This is retrospective. That's looking at, I'll be coming to you. So that's understood in him coming in the person of his other self, the Holy Spirit. That's the context of John 14. It's there. He's already made those statements. I'll be coming to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go. I'm going to the Father, and the Father is greater than I. 
Now, in the Godhead, I believe Jesus Christ would always see his Father's greater. But the Father would look at Jesus and would feel the same way about Jesus. Because in the persons, they embody infinite humility and they always are seeking to exalt the other. But most people understand this in terms of the theology. Jesus is speaking from his unglorified humanity. That in his unglorified humanity, he is referring to the Father is greater than who he is. When he talks about no one knows the day of the hour, only my Father in heaven, he's speaking from his unglorified humanity. He knows the day and hour now. We know that from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and following. He knows. He in his glorified state is an absolutely one in Godhead and humanity glorified. That which was progressive in his humanity on earth and time. He goes on to say, And now I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it comes to pass you may believe. I will not speak much more to you, for the ruler of the world is coming. And Satan still is the ruler of the world. As Cosmocrator, Ephesians 6, he's the world ruler, and under him are various spiritual potentates who are world rulers, Cosmocrators, Ephesians 6 and 12. But Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is not Cosmocrator, he's Pantocrator, which means ruler over all. Not only all all the earth, but the entire universe, entire cosmos. The ruler of the world. He's not the ruler of the universe. He's the ruler of the world. He has a right because Adam surrendered that jurisdiction when he rebelled. And that comes out in Luke chapter 4, the temptation when Satan comes to Jesus. And when he showed him all the kingdoms of this world, lifting him up to this very high place, showed him all the kingdoms of this world, he said, all this I will give to you and their legal jurisdiction to exercise power if you will fall down and worship me. For it has been handed over to me to give to whomever I choose. All that's required is you worship me. This is his jurisdiction. The rule of this world is coming. When we think of that, on the cross, Luke chapter 22, he's speaking to those betraying him. He's being arrested there in the garden. And he says... In verse 53, while I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour in the power of darkness. In other words, he recognized that through the human instrumentality of the Sanhedrin, Satan is there to do him in. Satan is there to kill him. He's the murderer. He's the murderer, the liar, and the thief. That's what he is. So he's using human puppets and instrumentalities. So the ruler of this world is coming. He has his agents, the Sanhedrin. He's employing the Roman legal system. He will be crucified. He's coming. And Satan is behind this. And he has nothing in me. He has no Adamic flesh. There's nothing foreskin on his heart. He is absolutely one with the Father. So that when he has made sin... He's wrapped in that corporate identification with the Adamic race as the last Adam, and he is judged and put to death. That's what qualifies him to go to the cross. He, Satan, has nothing in me. So he's been tested, and he stands approved, and now he's qualified to go to the cross. So, the rapture. The prince of this world will come, and he will seek to touch anything he can that he will seek to devour, 1 Peter 5, 8, and he can devour flesh. You want to continue on in your carnal ways? There's a time coming, the day of visitation, when the prince of this world will come, and if he can find something in you, it's dinner time, and God's going to allow it. And so the church of Laodicea, where no sin is mentioned at all, I'm rich and I have need of nothing, I'll vomit you out of my mouth, Satan will devour that. We have to understand that Satan is God's legal agent to deal with everything in mankind that is legally under the judgment of God. And the flesh has been legally judged. When we walk on that, we come under legal accusation of the adversary. That's the way it works. He has nothing in me. So if we grow up into him with reference to all things, as the head of Ephesians 4.15... As he's fully formed in us, and as that comes to maturation, and the final generation, which will embody the accumulation of previous generations, coming to full stature in Christ, there's going to be a corporate and collective, unified, attaining the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, then Satan must be allowed judicially to come and seek if there's anything he can devour. That's 1 Peter 5.8. You think, well, that's just there in the Bible dealing with testing of Christians. It's eschatological as well. 1 Peter 4.7, the end of all things is at hand. That's eschatological. 
it's time for judgment to begin in the household of God, 1 Peter 4.12. So if he's seeking to devour, it's an eschatological, it's the salvation that's ready to be revealed to the saints. So there it is. He will come, and there will be a generation. They will still have a sin nature, but the outer man has been dealt with. The inner man is strengthened. There's the ascendancy and resurrection union with the Lord, and ascension union with the Lord. The prince will come. He will take what is rightfully his, and then he can go no further. Because the people that are in ex anastasis, he cannot bypass that. There's no veil of flesh. The flesh is not there practically and experientially. And the rapture will occur. It will. It's a certainty. Have you ever think about that? That there's actually going to be a rapture? In a moment, the twinkling of an eye? Bam! If you go on the internet, YouTube, there is an amazing video. It shows a guy up there talking about the coming of the Lord. And these kids are out there in the audience. And he's up there saying, Jesus comes, lightning comes from the east to the west. Are you ready? And he's preaching this. And there's this huge clap of lightning. Bam! And about three-fourths of the people are just suddenly gone. He's gone. And these people are in the ground. And they're looking around. You know, when Enoch was taken, they were looking all over for him. He was not found. They actually were looking for him. When the rapture comes, what happened to all these people? They're going to be looking. Just like that. Just in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, it's the word atomos. It's the nanosecond. If you take a second and divide it into a billion segments, pick out one of those nanoseconds, that's the rapture. But twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen. But something has to lead up to that. There is something morally and spiritually has to take place. And so in Jesus, our head, in his humanity, Satan came and he said that he has nothing in me. So when he comes at the end, he will get Laodicea, but he will not be able to go past that which is Philadelphia. And so with Philadelphia, it's having done all to stand, Ephesians 6, having done all to stand. And you're standing. That means you don't have to advance anymore. You're holding the Ephesian position. In Revelation 3.11, let no one take your crown. In other words, it's all judicially weighed and there is a standard of fullness and God cannot change that. So if we forfeit that which would be our reward, it goes to somebody else. Let no one take your crown. See that? You're a victor's wreath, which means we have to hold on to it. Hold on to it. Or we press on, like I'm reading in the arena of faith. Wow. Wow, what a book. Wasted Privileges is the chapter I'm on now. I told the Lord, I said, I look back on my life, if I could live it over, it would be very much different. I was listening to Eric Ludy, what was that message? Something on the testing of faith and faithfulness. Defining moment of obedience. Yeah, I watched that. I, I saw the integrity of that man, how he lived, and how he lived every day as if the wife that he was going to marry was watching him. I said, that's incredible integrity. To have that kind of integrity. And I said, I can't go back and change anything, but if Bertha Smith can have a whole new opportunity after she was retired by the Baptist Association and enter into a very fruitful and productive era of her life, 70 to her home going, then there's certainly hope for us. And if you're younger than me, well, you can really take advantage of that. I just say that because I'm really serious with the Lord about this. I absolutely, when I look into his eyes at the beam of seat, I want to look with absolute and utter and complete dikaiosune, a righteousness that corresponds to his standards of fullness, the reward which the righteous judge will give me on that day. He's referred to as the righteous judge. doesn't say loving and merciful. He's all that. But the beam of seat, it's not about love and mercy. The righteous judge... 2 Timothy 4, 7, the following, will award me on that day. I want to be able to look in his face and have no shrinking back. 1 John 2, 20, in shame. Because in the manifestation he's appearing, we become manifest. When he is manifest, 1 John 3, 1 and following, we shall be like him. We'll see him as he is. Why? Because at the beam seat, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, we will all become manifest before him. 
and that which is according to Christ stands that which is gold, silver and precious stone remains the divine nature that which is wood, hay and stubble nothing sinful about wood you can live in a house that's made of wood and the house will outlive you but it won't stand the fire there's the bema seat the fire will consume that which can be consumed and that fire is the divine standard that's measured by that which is either according to Christ or not according to Christ it's that simple if we think about the fact that we're going to be manifested before the judgment seat of Christ Paul says therefore knowing the fear of the Lord we persuade men 2 Corinthians 5.11 the fear of the Lord there is in view of the judgment seat of Christ for Christians it's that fear Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 7 1. You see? Prince's world is coming out of nothing to me. That's individual, that's personal, and now that is to have its corporate and final outworking leading up to and culminating in the rapture of the church. So, Father, may you sanctify and set apart that which we've looked at tonight to work in us that which is pleasing in your sight so that we as members of your body might cooperate with you more intelligently so that Jesus Christ might be fully formed in us and through the suffering and the challenges that we face, the tribulation and testing, child training, we might be more fully conformed to the image of your Son. We want full conformity, Lord. We don't want anything left in us that represents a conformity to the old man. We agree that everything in us that is capable of dying and that will not appear in heaven needs to go in this life. The knife of circumcision. Let it cut and remove anything and everything that cannot be glorified, Lord. In other words, we accept the radical nature of the cross, the scalpel of the cross to have its perfect way in us so we truly might attain the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, not only personally but also corporately. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.